Good morning church, we're going to go into a new series this morning all about our emotional intelligence. I'm very excited about this, I've been doing lots of reading, lots of prayer, thinking about you in mind as I've been preparing this message. It has challenged me, it's encouraged me and I hope it'll do the same for you as well. Now the minute I say emotional intelligence, I'll get a number of different reactions on the other side of this screen, I know. But I hope that this message will help prepare our hearts, our minds, and our emotions ready to have a conversation about emotional intelligence. So this message is a setup for the conversation so that we can grow together on this journey. So to start this conversation, I'm going to be using the scripture Mark chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me, turn them on, whichever way you use the Bible this morning. And we're going to go to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious whale came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in a stern sleep on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you afraid? Do you have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This morning, I titled the message, Storm, Emotions and Faith. So often we don't realise we're acting on our impulse of emotions triggered by the environment around us rather than the lens of faith until a storm brews up in our life. Until chaos surrounds us, we don't realise or acknowledge that we are being led in our life by decisions not being prayed about through the lens of faith, but actually through the lens of fear, through the lens of anger, through different emotions. Now, there are different storms of life, and maybe you can relate to some of these storms that I'll mention now. There are storms of grief, of loss, of pain. There can be storms of breakdown in relationships, whether that's a friend, whether that's a family member, whether it's a child-parent relationship, a marriage. We can experience job loss as a storm in our lives. There can be other unexpected tragedies, unexpected changes, and we know that all too well with COVID-19. There are storms that brew up around us all the time. And as followers of Jesus, we're not immune from experiencing storms. But the difference is that we have Jesus with us in the storm. But the storm exposes us. It can make us vulnerable. It can shake us up and expose. Not putting something there that wasn't there, but exposing something that already was hidden. A weakness that was already there. And what I hope that we can reflect on together this morning is what is the storms around us opening, addressing, making us aware of that's in our life? What are you vulnerable to? What are you exposed to? What are you experiencing in the midst of the chaos around us? See, the storms can trigger many different emotions. And here we see how fear has been one that's been triggered. But we've got to acknowledge that just because emotions are triggered in us does not mean that they dictate the choices, the thought life, the words that we say, or the actions that we make. We have a choice over that. We have the power to make that decision. But too often it's easy for us to play the victim card. We would rather say that we don't have the control. It's been influenced by the situation around us, by other people around us, maybe by our spouse. We say, oh, they've triggered that emotion. What else do you expect but that response? And we can pass the blame on because it means that we don't have to own it. We have no responsibility and we don't have to change. So it's much easier for us to blame emotions. But it's also easy for us to demonize these emotions, to make these emotions either good or evil. And as a Pentecostal church, sometimes we in a tradition have ended up demonizing emotions to say it is the devil. And I tell you now, the devil is happy to take ownership of those emotions. Because as long as you blame him for that emotion being triggered in your world and for those thought lives to have been as a consequence um, gripping you with fear, 
as long as that has been the reason why you're passing the blame for the words that you say and profess over your life and over your relationships and over your future and your job and your ministry, as long as that's the reason why you put off the um, change in the way that you act, then we're never going to make a change. If we blame the devil, he goes, well, that's great because you don't realize the power is already within you to make the change yourself. And when we pass the bucket, when we say it is somebody else, we're saying, actually, I don't have the power within me to make a difference. So we have a choice to make in life, not just in the storms, but especially the storms make it more obvious to us than any other season of our time. Do we want to live in a life led by our emotions, dictated by how we're triggered by conversations, what we see on Instagram, what we see in, um, on the uh, media? Or do you want to have a life that's triggered by the word of God, triggered by the lens that he has put on for us and the conversation that he wants to have with us? We have a choice whether we want to live a world that is outside in or we want to live in a life that is led by inside out. So we see in this passage that the disciples were crippled by their emotions. And what I mean by that was that not just they experienced fear, that's not the issue, but that fear completely overtook their thought life and their mouths and their action in the way that they displayed their next words to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't seem to be very compassionate in this situation. We might feel that if someone is portraying and expressing, um, especially an emotion of fear, that we should um, consolidate them, that we should go around them and give them a hug and just listen to the words that they have to say. And yes, Jesus did listen, and yes, Jesus did calm the storm. But Jesus' response directly to the disciples was not one of, it's okay, but why? Why did you act out of fear and not of faith? Do you still not believe? There are five basic emotions that they say we have. Uh, fear being one, happiness, sadness, anger, and disgust. And I want to suggest that Jesus does know what these emotions are like because we know that he was fully human and fully God, which means that he knows what it's like to be triggered by emotions. He knows what it's like to encompass all these emotions. We know from reading some of the scriptures the Gospels give us when we see Jesus encountering um, Lazarus' death and that whole situation that we're seeing sadness portrayed by Jesus in his expression of his life. Or when he goes in the temple, and especially when he's engaging with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that he ends up displaying a lot of anger and disgust. Or when he sees the centurion and he goes, I have not seen a faith like this amongst all my people yet. And you can see how he's expressing his happiness in that moment. And maybe that comment makes you a little uncomfortable, the idea that Jesus has emotions. But again, I come back to the point that emotions are not good or evil. They can be positive or negative, but actually the good or evil comes from the thoughts that are attached to it. The good or evil comes from the words that we put onto that emotion. The good or evil comes from the actions that we express from that. So Jesus understands emotions. So then again, why is he being so harsh to the disciples who are experiencing fear? Why is he saying, you have no faith, what's going on here? Well, I would like us to go a little bit further, all the way back to the beginning of Mark chapter 4. Because we can sometimes take these little sections as little bits of the book. But we've got to realize that as the um, writer was writing Mark, as he was writing this gospel, it wasn't the little chapter dividers that we like to see. And this is all part of the same day. So we're going to read some teachings that Jesus was saying, parables that he was using to tell his people about things to come and about how to live a life of faith. And we're going to read some of these teachings and maybe that'll help put the whole thing into a bigger picture. So if you come me to Matthew chapter 4 verses 1, and we're going to hear about the parable of the sower. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teachings said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up 
and choked the plant, so they did not bear grain. Still others' seeds fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. Some multiply in thirty, some sixty, some hundred times. Then Jesus said to them, skipping over to verse 13, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path. Where the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like the seed sown on rocky places, hear the word that was once received. And at once received it with joy. <laughs> Try this again. Yeah, this goes on. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path. Where the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke up the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times that was sown. Here in this parable, Jesus explicitly explains why the seed that is the good seed is the seed of the word of God, that is the seed of faith, the seed of his teaching can have a different production in different people's lives. Here he's saying it's all about the cultivation, it's about the ground, it's about where it's laid. And here's some lessons we can learn explicitly attached to how the disciples responded. So number one, it's important to know that community is so important. Here in the first example, the seed is just thrown onto the rocky ground. It's not in community. If you're hearing the word of God today and you're not connected to our local church, whether it's us or another family of, of God, then you need to connect in because whenever the word of God comes in, you're not protected by the family of God and the Satan can just come in and take that word and steal it from you. But then we see in the next one how people can receive it in the first instance of the joy but then it quickly leaves us. And this here, we see the link between our emotions and our spiritual maturity. And if we don't tend after the seed and um, look after that seed, the joy that we received it in, it can quickly be taken away. Have you ever listened to a sermon? Have you ever received a word of encouragement? Have you ever been in a devotional on one of your mornings? And then very quickly, just as quick as you receive that revelation from God, it can be taken away from you by an emotion that's been triggered. Whether in the church setting and you go to get a cup of tea and you feel like someone's given you a glare. Whether you're at home and you turn off the church online and then one of your children causes a tantrum. And you forget about the seed that's been planted because the emotion has sparked something off and you've been led and dictated by that. And then the third seed, where it's about not just about your emotions, but the weeds that are around us. It's so important that we don't let other people's toxic expressions of emotions dictate the seed that's in our life and suffocate what God has put inside of us. Here, the revelation that I got as I was reading it was, we can be under the best teaching of the world. The disciples were under Jesus' teaching, the best rabbi ever to walk the earth, the best person to expouse the scriptures and give understanding. But yet, they could still miss it. They could still miss the understanding of it because the seed was a good seed. But their emotions that were triggered thereafter meant the seed was stolen, the seed was trampled on, the seed was suffocated. We've got to ask ourselves, are we connected? What do our roots look like in this season? Let's go to the next parable. There's the parable of the growing seed and the parable of the mustard seed. Picking up from verse uh, 26. It says this, I've got, got it written down. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself, the soil produces again. 
first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel of the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say if the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable should we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch on its shade. With many similar parables Jesus spoke of the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. Where does our faith come from? Now, some of you good ones, you're already shouting, faith comes from hearing the word of God. And that's right. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. But then we've got to think about what other voices we're letting into our minds. What other voices we're letting into our world. We know that all of us have faith. Romans 12 verse 3 says that God has given us all a measure of faith. And sometimes we can use the comparison game of, well, I haven't got as much faith as that person. Or, well, I haven't got as much faith as this other person. But we all have a measure of faith. Maybe if I brought up one of our destiny kids or destiny youth, and we could compare between them the measure of their muscles, for example. We could say, okay, well, one of them has more muscles than the other. And you go, well, of course, because they're older. Well, actually, no. They have the same amount of muscles. But the only reason that one has got bigger is because they've developed it, because they've exercised it. And it's the same for us in our journey of faith. We have to exercise our faith. And we've been learning so much about having daring faith over the last 10 weeks of our series. But it really made me start to reflect and question of, how come we can still be hindered in our faith and moving our faith into action and about moving from talking about the ideas, hearing about faith to actually living a life of faith. And here's where I came across um, a study done by educational psychologists and they explain the stages of how we change. And I think this will be really helpful for us to understand as uh, believers. So they use five different levels of uh, the stages that it takes for us to change. Number one is awareness. Now, for you hearing this, this might be the first time you've ever heard that you can live a life led by faith, not emotions. And so you've become aware and you're thinking, oh, that's an interesting idea. Then the next stage is to ponder it. And this is what one of the fundamentals of our connect groups are, to ponder, to talk it over. You will listen, hopefully, to the rest of this series and there'll be more information and it'll get your brain churning and thinking more about it to understand more about the concept of living a life through faith rather than emotions. Then the next step is value. This is where we believe it's important and we start to dabble into a few new behaviours. Maybe over the Daring Faith series, you've dabbled in a few new behaviours with the devotional book we've been going through. Maybe you've started to pray a little bit. Maybe you've started to try and give. Number four is all about priority. It's reprioritizing our time, our schedule, our money, our energy, reprioritizing our relationships. It's reprioritizing everything. And then the last stage is it's owning it. So it's more than just reprioritizing everything. It's that all the decisions, all the actions are based on this new value. And so much so that if anything comes against it, it feels, of, um, feels like we're violating this value. But you'll notice on the grid here behind me that there is a gap. There is a gap between stage three and stage four, between value and reprioritizing. And the psychologists explain this gap. They explain actually because the gap between moving from the value to prioritizing this new idea is a difficult shift. It's one that causes a lot of challenge for us. And they say we can only get move from this value to reprioritizing in little, small, incremental steps. Do you remember at the beginning of the year when we did a habit series and we learned about how it takes small decisions that build up a catalyst for change? James Clear, who is the author of Atomic Habits, an excellent book about this, and he says this, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs. But as, the votes, but as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your identity. This is why habits are crucial. They cast repeated votes for the certain type of person. What are you voting for? 
in your identity. Every time you have that emotion triggered, depending on what thought you attach to it, depending on what words you put to it and how you express it through your actions, is adding to your identity. You get to make that choice. Let's use it from the Bible's perspective, Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Dr. Caroline Leaf, who we will be using some of her understandings later on in this series. She is a believer of Jesus and also a neurologist. And she explains how we have the power to change our mind from a science perspective, not just a faith-based one. She explains how we can create new pathways and how we have the power to change our brain and how every thought we have a physical like little birth tree that comes out into our brain and how fascinating that is that through the scriptures it's saying is a continuous verb we need to continue to renew our minds and from the scientists they're saying yes it's important to continue to renew your minds and program it with the word of God. In the habit series, we learned about the habit loop. We learned that there was a cue, there's a craving and a reward. And in essence, emotions can be a little bit like a cue because we have a choice still. We know that in the habits, we might have a cue of seeing that cheese in the fridge. We might have that cue of that biscuit jar. We might have that cue around us for what we maybe desire to do. But actually, we still have a craving there and we still have a reward choice to make. Here with our emotions, we have the same to do. If you have anger that's, um, that's triggered in your emotions, you still have a decision to make. You can rewire your brain. I think that's incredible. You can rewire your brain to have different cravings and different rewards attached to those emotions. But don't be fooled. Yes, it does take lots of small little steps, but are they not worth doing so? Because here's the thing, if we're trusting our emotions more than God, then what it's saying is, I don't trust you, God. If I'm saying that when I have anxiety, that actually I need to go and have a smoke because that will help me, we're basically saying, God, you can't help me with my anxiety. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't other medical things and other things that can help us with our mental health. But as a general whole, if we're using things as an excuse, we're basically saying, God, we don't trust you with this part of our life. I hope that this message will help us grow in our self-awareness because the more self-aware that we become, it helps us to grow spiritually mature. It'll help us in our ministry as we serve God's purposes. It'll help us as we worship God together because we can check our hearts and our motivation. It will help us with our relationships as we're aware of how our emotions can ripple and affect one another. It will help us as our mission because then we can represent Christ even better. Because remember church, we are representing Jesus. We are his bride. We are his ambassadors. And we've got to remember that what people see of us is what they see of God. And we want to give them a true representation of what good lo God looks like. We are placing Christ on display through our relationships, through our stress management, through our empathy, through our emotional expression. So wherever you are today, I hope that you start to think about your awareness of your emotions because they do have an impact on our spiritual maturity. Let's go back to the storm with the disciples. We see that their emotional immaturity and their unhealthy attachment to emotions meant that they decided to live in that moment dictated by their emotions rather than faith. And in this scenario, have you ever heard in a storm, especially in COVID-19, that we can use the expression, we are all in the same boat. But I think actually we've got to recognize we're not all in the same boat. Economically, we know that some people are in a yacht and some people in a rowboat. And that's why as a church, we've stood together with organizations like the Moses Project that are putting together food deliveries for those that are less advantaged in this season and are struggling more than others. Because we recognize we're not all in the same boat. 
But also spiritually here in this story, we're not all in the same boat. There's a reason why in this story I believe that the narrator mentions there are other boats. Because in this storm you get to have a choice. Do you want Jesus in your boat or not? And maybe you're struggling with the storms of life around you. I want to encourage you to have Jesus in your life because he's the one that can calm the storm with, his, with just one word. He is the one that wants to be the one you turn to, even in your emotions. Even if he says, hey, what's going on, child? I want you to have more faith. He still wants you to turn to him. And so at the end of this, we're going to have a moment where if you want to say, actually, I want Jesus on my boat. When storms of life come and we know that we're not immune to them as believers, believers of Jesus, but we know that actually we can have him with us and that changes our perspective on the whole situation. But the second group of people that I want to just spend time to pray for at the end as well is people who actually have Jesus on their boat, as it were. You are saved. You are part of the family. But just like the disciples, you can have Jesus on your boat and still act out in fear. You can still have an unhealthy relationship with your emotions. You can still be dictated and led by your emotions rather than faith. And maybe your emotions have stopped you maturing in your walk with Jesus. Maybe you've been part of Destiny Church for many months, many years, and you know too well how the emotions have stopped you in your growth here whether it's been in a connect group and maybe you want to be a host, but then the emotion just dictates over. Maybe it's been in a sermon and you hear something, but then the emotion just robs you from that joy. We want to encourage you to be aware of your emotions. And through your connect groups, you can look at some practical ways and we're going to unpack more practical strategies throughout this series to help you with your emotional intelligence but one simple tool that can really help is just acknowledge that you have an emotion naming it is one of the first steps because it's the first step of the change being aware of it and if we can be aware of it whether it's through making a little journal of our emotions it will help us to recognize are we making decisions are we making choices out of faith or out of our emotions so let us pray together as we just close this message. God, I thank you that you are with us if we want you to be part of our boat. And I pray right now for any person that says, I know that these storms are tough, but I know that with you, it'll be a different perspective. I pray for every person that wants to accept you into their lives, into their world, right now, that they will just open up their lives right now. And if this is you right now, why do you just pray this simple prayer with me? Father God, I thank you for your love, for your hope. And I'm sorry for the way that I've acted, how I've sinned against you, the mistakes I've made, how I've made decisions out of emotions. But I take the decision, I make the choice right now to make you the center of my world, to allow you into my boat. And will you help me through the storms of this world? In Jesus' name, amen. And God, we just pray right now for those that know you so, so well, but still struggle with the idea of living out of faith rather than emotions. I pray for your followers, for your children right now, that for those that are worried that fear is crippling them, especially fear, but we know there's anger and other emotions that can be attached and depression, we just pray that they will turn to you, hear the words that you're sowing into them, protect it, cultivate it, so that it can grow deep roots, so that no matter what storm comes into their world, that they're able to withstand the storm with you. In Jesus' name, amen.